had a map of Manhattan in which they were trying to estimate the damage an atomic bomb would have and how many people would be killed. This map was, was developed in 1943. You know, we know the evidence is there. We just have to keep looking. Something else was going on. What they told us was not the way it happened. What they told us was not the way it happened. And now my fear is in the United States, because we have the Patriot Act and because we have all sorts of ways to stifle inquiry, to stop information from getting out, more secrets can be kept, more programs can be instituted about which we will know nothing until it's too late. Kennedy was perceived as a threat to the program. He had signed treaties with the Soviets, promised not to invade Cuba. This was against the Nazi ideology. This was contrary to a Nazi platform, not an American platform. Kennedy was a very popular president, you know. But his idea of cutting a deal with the Soviets and essentially saving the world from thermonuclear war in 1962 was disregarded because many in the military thought we should have gone to war. The Nazi right-wing coalition was very strong. In the United States, it still is. If you look at who finances and who helps certain, a certain political party in the United States, you're going to find that there's tremendous uh, support from Nazi and neo-Nazi organizations for that political party. One party in particular, not the other. So you're going to ask yourself, well, what is all this about? Reagan, President Reagan, of course, was heavily supported by something called the World Anti-Communist League. The World Anti-Communist League was populated almost entirely by Nazis, former Nazi uh, officers, former people who had worked against the Soviets, uh, working for uh, fascist and Nazi dictatorships. I and mean, it was incredible stuff because they were true believers. George Patton famously said, we were pointing our guns in the wrong direction. When we went after the Nazis, we should have gone after the Soviets. Um, there's a lot that uh, we can talk about, and I don't have the time, I don't think. How am I going for time? I'll just keep talking until you tell me to stop. Okay. Really? Oh, cool. Okay. In that case, the pause that refreshes. Here's the question I want to ask. What more was there at stake? Why was Kennedy killed? It had to be for some really big reason. It couldn't be because they didn't like his hair, you know. It had to be for something really specific and something big, something major, something that was going to affect the economy and the political structure, power structures that existed. Did Kennedy's insistence on going to the moon rob other projects of finances and resources that they needed? Was the moon a kind of chimera, a kind of... Uh, uh, quixotic dream that we should go to the moon first and show our superiority over the Soviets. Was it something that took money and power away from this inner circle of right-wing zealots, of Nazis who had a different approach to science, a different approach to the space program, people who wanted to do their own thing, and that Kennedy's insistence that we we're going to put all of our money into the space program took away power from them, gave more power to NASA, but took it away from the military and took it away from other projects. So was there, in the 1960s, a secret space program? We talk a lot about the military-industrial complex. Um, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower warned us about that in his farewell address when he left office. Um, and we've focused on that to a great deal, but we don't really know what it is. We know it has to do with guns and the army. But remember that the, that the military also was developing rockets, uh, jet propulsion, various types of missiles. Um, NASA was solely occupied with visiting other planets, according to its brief. Its space science was satellites going to other planets. It was a non-military application of space technology. The military was still involved in their own aspects of space technology. And this involved 
missiles. It involved alternate sources of energy. It involved different types of uh, aircraft that could try tre fly at tremendous speeds. Uh, a couple of, uh, about 18 months ago, as an example, I was invited to uh, participate as an observer uh, in, a, in a meeting of former intelligence officers uh, out in Las Vegas. Go figure. Um, and during the course of that, that time that I spent there, we visited very, several military installations, and we had to have all sorts of security checks done and all of that. And you've all heard of Area 51. Well, there was, a, there was a presentation given, much like I'm giving one now, on Area 51 by one of the guys who was there, who spent his lifetime there. And he was very bitter about the fact that even the CIA could have an association where former spooks could sit down and chat and have drinks and talk about their failures or successes, but that the guys at Area 51 could not. They're still bound by secrecy laws of things that happened back in 19, the 1950s and 1960s. You might remember the U-2 incidents. You know, the Nazis had the V-2, we had the U-2. And the U-2 was our, our, our stealth uh, plane that took photographs of the Soviet Union, of other countries. It was a spy plane. That, of course, was, was developed at Area 51. That was where it was housed. That's where it was based. So all of this took place at Area 51. And Area 51, according to popular uh, understanding was a military installation, a military base. That's not exactly true. It was an intelligence operation. It had nothing really to do directly with the military. It was an indirect relationship that was, that, that was had at Area 51. So you had uh, the development of the U-2. People, of course, always say they were re back engineering, reverse engineering spacecraft or UFOs and that sort of thing there. This guy would not talk about that, of course. He poo-pooed the idea. But his presentation began with a picture of an alien and the theme song from the X-Files, right? So he starts his presentation this way, and of course everybody laughs politely or nervously, and then he goes on to give his, his talk about Area 51, and thank you. He says I have until 3 o'clock. No, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, I've got a lot more presentations in here, believe me, we could do this all night. Um, so he went into a lot of detail about what happened up there and how we lost more of our CIA agents in a single accident involving Area 51 than we ever lost in the field. So there was a lot going on up there, and that's still classified. He still can't really talk about it, not even to a group of former intelligence officers who had all signed secrecy oaths and everything else, and he still couldn't go into it. You know, so his presentation was rather thin, but he did talk about the U-2 programs and Francis Gary Powers and all of that, and everybody in the audience understood that when he's talking about Francis Gary Powers, the pilot of the U-2 who was shot down over the Soviet Union, we're also talking about Lee Harvey Oswald. We're also talking about Oswald's involvement with that particular part of the space program because Oswald was stationed, as we know, at Atsugi Air Force Base in Japan, which was one of only two bases in the world at which the U-2 would take off from. That was the base where it was kept. So the flights from Japan went over the Soviet Union, and Oswald's job as a radar operator was in the room with the traffic controllers that were sending up the U-2s. So every time we turn around, in, in these major political events, we run across the space program again, in some way, shape, or form. It was insidious. It, it involved all sorts of aspects of, of American life, things that we would never expect. Why did people who worked at Riley Coffee Company all go to work for NASA? Why did Oswald claim that he was getting a job at NASA? Why did all these other spooks and all these other strange people wind up somehow with the space program and then again with the Kennedy assassination? There is something very serious going on here. There's a very strange part of American history, and by extension, in a way, of American and world history that's taking place with the space program. If you look at the space programs in Europe, if you look at the space programs in China and other parts of the world, you will see all the connections going back to this one central uh, phenomenon of the space race between the Soviet Union and the United States. 
and you have to ask yourself, was it really a space race? You know, politicians on both sides may have thought it was a race. Uh, Low-level politicians may have thought this. They may have been stricken with fear that we were in a race against the Russians for domination of space. We may have thought this. But the scientists on either side, I think, never had any illusions about this. There was no race. There was a cooperation. You know, someone at some point decided the Soviets can go first. They'll have their Sputnik, and they'll send a dog into space, and then eventually they will send an astronaut into space. The Russians had the first go at it. How could they possibly, when we had the creme de la creme, when we had all of the best and the brightest of the Nazi space program, how did that happen? It had to have been a cooperation between the scientists themselves. This implicates or implies that there was another level of government in the world at that time. That there was another basis of cooperation, of collaboration between people that we thought were dire enemies. That there were networks of people operating throughout the world who cooperate with each other in some way, shape, or form. And this is what we have in the, in the space program. They cooperated so much that people died. People were killed. People were assassinated. Serious investigations into the UFOs led to the deaths of a lot of people. James McDonald, famous scientist who went before Congress and insisted that the UFO sightings were not the result of sightings of the planet Venus, swamp gas, or weather balloons. For this, he was ridiculed. He was later found dead. They said he committed suicide. They always say they committed suicide. That's the standard response. Murray Jessup, right, involved in the Philadelphia experiment stuff and a researcher into UFOs and all of that, commits suicide, they say, in Miami, Florida. You know, all of these people who are seriously involved in the study, uh, who try to promote it, who try to talk reasonably about it, not wild-eyed, aluminum foil hat-wearing people, you know, talking that their minds are being controlled from Venus or something, these are serious people. James McDonald was a very serious guy. He was, a, he was a scientist. He was a doctor, a PhD, a meteorologist. He knew what he was talking about. Dead. Uh, Jessup, a very reasonable guy, a very sort of scientific-minded guy, not the kind of wild-eyed guy who would believe anything that anybody ever told him, in the last month or two of his life was extremely paranoid, extremely nervous. He felt that there was something going on, that somebody was after him, and then he wound up dead in Miami. So we have these things connected with the UFO program. Why? If the UFO phenomenon is a figment of our imagination, if we're projecting stuff onto atmospheric conditions and we're seeing ghosts or something like that, why all of this secrecy? Why all the murder? Why all the suicides? What does that have to do with just believing in six impossible things before breakfast? There's something very serious, something that points to people who are willing to spill blood in the furtherance of a goal or an objective. And the best example we have of that in the last hundred years has been, of course, the, the Nazis and the SS. People who thought that to kill huge numbers of people was justified for a kind of spiritual reason. The Nazis believed very seriously. This was not propaganda. They believe very seriously in the idea that in the blood is the spirit. They believe that uh, your race carried a spiritual component and that those of inferior races, quote unquote, uh, were inferior spiritually, so it was okay to kill them. It was, in fact, it was necessary to kill them, to purify the rest of the planet, to purify the race. This was something they believed very sincerely. And they looked to American scientists who came up with this idea in something called eugenics and the race science program. So, when you have people who believe that the ends justify the means, when you have people who believe that murder is acceptable, even on a huge scale, because of the responsibility they have to jumpstart evolution, the next stage of it, and then they lose a war, do you really think they're going to go away? Do you really think they're going to say, shucks, lost the war, I guess we're all going to become Democrats? You know, it's not going to happen. It just won't happen. Many times I've, I've told people the same uh, example of Christianity. Christianity began and lived underground, in cemeteries, in catacombs, meeting secretly at night for over 300 years before it was accepted in the Roman Empire. 300 years 
these people who believed in a kind of an impossible thing.